I, there's a lot of material I want to share with you. I honestly don't know if we'll have a, uh, a chance to to get through all of it, but I hope that whatever, whatever we do cover will be stimulating and will lead to some uh, some good questions uh, uh, during the Q&A. So uh, let me begin by saying that in recent years, uh, recent decades really, several studies, mostly based on, on sociological surveys, have attempted to identify, to describe, to measure patterns of Jewish identity in the United States. I'm talking here about very broad patterns. A few of the most discussed of these, um, of these studies have suggested, among other things, that quote unquote attachment to Israel is relatively weak and maybe weakening among many young Jewish adults, especially among those who belong to what one may call the American Jewish mainstream, uh, that is, uh, those young American Jews who are not religiously orthodox, who either belong to the reform stream or the conservative stream, or simply uh, uh, denominationally um, unaffiliated. This argument about uh, weakening attachment is sometimes called the distancing thesis. Uh, some scholars, uh, recently people like Leonard Sachs, uh, Charles Kadushin, uh, Theodore Sasson of, of uh, Brandeis University have countered this uh, thesis uh, by arguing that the affinity uh, that young American Jews have to Israel uh, is actually a cyclical thing that uh, as young American Jews grow, as they build families, they come closer to Israel. Moreover, uh, uh, Ted Sasson, who was here, what was last year, I guess, talking about his research, uh, he's next door. Uh, he says that uh, some of the uh, ways in which young American Jews relate to Israel have not been properly uh, plumbed and understood because they don't match um, previous patterns of attachment. So, for example, young American Jews might, let's say, you know, uh, uh, channel their funds and their energies to specific Israeli NGOs, specific Israeli political causes, rather than, let's say, giving money to the United Jewish Appeal, as their parents or grandparents might have done. At any rate, I'm not here really to talk about uh, detachment, uh, but I have to tell you that the impression of overall drift away from Israel has been a powerful motif in public, private, academic, and non-academic treatments of the relationship between American Jews on one hand and Israel and Zionism on the other. Now, I began my own study of Generation Y Jews, uh, that is to say uh, people between 18 and 33 years of age, uh, under the shadow of debates about detachment or about uh, uh, loss of attachment. Um, since then, since 2012 on and off, among many, many other responsibilities, I've been uh, I've been uh, uh, interviewing Jewish millennials, among others, uh, who identify strongly as pro-Israel or as quote-unquote Zionist. Now, my study is strictly qualitative. It's not quantitative. Simply put, I'm not trying to do a head count, so I'm not in any position to weigh in on the validity or weakness of the distancing thesis. I only want to provide something like a high resolution picture of those young adults who call themselves either Zionist or pro-Israel or both. Within that larger, um, within that larger uh, purpose, my aim is to address uh, overarching questions that sociological surveys tend not to be able to, uh, to address with a high degree of specificity and nuance. Um, First and foremost, why are my chosen subjects supportive of Israel, especially in a postmodern era in which uh, some scholars tell us that grand narratives of nationhood have given way to very personalized conceptions of the self uh, in relation to the world and particularly have, have led to a kind of a, a lessening uh, among young people of, the, of a sense of uh, social or communal obligation. So that's the first question. The second main question is what precisely, what precisely do Israel and Zionism mean to these young subjects? The third question is very traditional. So what, right? So in the interest of time, today I'm going to deal with the first two questions. 
Maybe if we have time at the end, I will delve into the third one. Before I do, before I do deal with these first two questions, I want to uh, clarify that uh, in the late 19th century, throughout the 20th century, to be a Zionist meant principally to be committed to two political, cultural, and, um, uh, and social goals. First and foremost, to ingather the Jewish masses of the diaspora in the ancestral homeland, the land of Israel, as it's traditionally known. Uh, and second, to participate directly in building a new, revitalized, and politically independent Jewish community in the land of Israel. Since the 1980s, though, I would say that the uh, colloquial, the uh, conversational meaning of the word Zionist has shifted dramatically in the United States. Uh, so, for example, when my young subjects say Zionist, they mostly just mean pro-Israel. So in the view of, uh, of uh, these young American Jews, um, one need not return to the homeland in order to be a good Zionist. Okay, so uh, let me give you uh, an illustrated summary of some of the things that I've found so far on the basis of 35 interviews and, uh, of course, reading some of the germane scholarly literature. First and foremost, why <clears throat> are the subjects pro-Israel? You might say, what's in it for them? Okay, so almost to a person, my 35 subjects have been born born into and reared in families that are basically warm and supportive and which have been able to convey to them some sort of Jewish consciousness and pride. Now this pride, this consciousness may take various forms, it may be very richly textured, it may be vague, or it may be somewhere in between. But these characteristics, these qualities are, 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 are marked by, always marked I would say, by the somewhat hazy idea that the family in which the subject is reared belongs to a social and cultural group, a, a larger um, uh, constellation with a unique history of suffering and overcoming adversity. That group, that constellation, is an ancient transgeographic entity or cohort called the Jews or the Jewish people. Okay, so here's how one subject is expressed what I'm talking about. And I draw your attention to the first item in your, in your handout. This is a fellow I, I'm calling Sammy. It's not his real name, but anyway. He writes, or he's, he, actually he says, quote, I was hooked on my Jewish identity from preschool. I loved it. I wanted to go to synagogue. I wanted to be engaged in Jewish activities. And then when I conceptualized the idea that there was a country for Jewish people, I needed to go there and see it for myself. That's my first understanding that I'm Jewish and that as a Jewish person, I'm part of a greater country and nation, Israel. My first real memory is probably watching Cecil B. DeMille's popular film, The Ten Commandments, during Passover when I was about four years old and feeling like, oh my God, I love this movie. I watched it over and over again as a little kid because I connected to the narrative of the land of Israel is promised land. This is our country. We also have to understand that my family, my, my, my mom is a huge Zionist. She's really involved with the young professionals in our non-Orthodox Jewish community in LA. She has traveled on several missions to Israel through the local Jewish Federation." End quote. Now, <clears throat> he goes on. He says a lot of interesting things, but uh, what I want to emphasize here is that he's essentially expressing a basic satisfaction, a basic enjoyment um, of the fact that he belongs to the cultural and institutional world of his parents. People who serve him, uh, or who used to serve him when he was a child, as models of Zionism. Notice, uh, by the way, that the mother is, quote unquote, a Zionist, even though she only travels there for, uh, for short periods of time, for relatively short periods of time. Now, not all of my subjects were as effusive, as enthusiastic as Sammy, yet I think they all revealed something that I think is rather unsurprising. For them, having an affinity for Israel functioned early on as a kind of extension of whatever Jewishness they acquired during the first stages of socialization. This is a kind of Jewishness that, of course, that they associated closely with their own families. I would say that what these subjects had as children is a relationship with a mostly symbolic Israel 
To them, this Israel represented the big us, what uh, <coughs> cultural anthropologists might call the super family, the ethnos, the kin-based or the kinship-based uh, cultural collective. I think we can therefore say that during childhood, my subjects acquired an emotional predisposition to support Israel later in life. Specifically, they learned to think of Israel as something like an abstract macro version of the loving family and local Jewish community to which they belong and which they now feel, feel belongs to them. Subjects who didn't experience Israel or Israelis in any deep, intimate way after their childhood years still, I think, tend to retain this basic sense of belonging. So they have become what you might call generic Jewish American supporters of Israel. <coughs> now these generic supporters don't do much, as far as I can tell, uh, don't do much besides look favorably upon Israel from afar. They say that Israel is very important to them, but when you look closely, they're not particularly interested in or knowledgeable about the country. They certainly don't get very exercised about the, what goes on inside of Israel, and they have no sustained interest in the contentious politics concerning Israel that often play themselves out in the public sphere among, among you know, lobbyists and activists and media pundits uh, and the ever-chattering intellectuals. So these generic supporters of Israel have a mostly inarticulate, but still, I, I would say, deep-seated perception that Jews have uh, collective needs and rights. However divided Jews may be, however diverse they may be, they still have collective needs and rights, especially the right to live in peace as a free people in their diasporic homes and, of course, in their ancestral homeland. How to solve the Arab-Israeli conflict? Well, uh, to a person, my, my subjects say, not just the generic supporters, mind you, but others as well, they say, two states for two peoples, right? That's, uh, that's the, uh, the fallback position. For these guys, for these generic supporters, though, there's no need, let's say, to learn Hebrew, no desire to read Israeli media, no, no uh, need to travel to Israel repeatedly, or to see much more than the touristic uh, highlights there. There's no need to defend Israel, no need to criticize Israel, except perhaps under very unusual circumstances like major wars or what have you. What I'm suggesting is that these, what I'm calling the generic supporters of Israel, see their Jewish identities as somehow related to Israel, but those identities are essentially diasporic. The U.S. is home, right? Israelis, on the other hand, are like second or third cousins, so to speak. All right, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. <coughs> Not on the handout, but nonetheless. One of my subjects, when I spoke to her uh, two years ago, was a newly minted social worker in her mid-twenties. I will call her Stacy. So Stacy uh, told me that she had been to Israel several times, mostly in order to visit her sister, who had moved there after high school. The, the, the sister was older, had a very different life than Stacy. I asked Stacy how she hoped to realize her Zionism now that she was an independent adult, and she said very simply that she wished to marry a Jew and have Jewish children. Okay, so here we have the sort of the, the <laughs> in in Nuche we have the classic case of somebody who fuses the personal and the collective, the familial and the super familial, you might say. All right. Now at this point, some of you may be asking yourselves, well, what's the big deal here? What's so surprising? Of course, young people who are raised in reasonably happy Jewish homes are going to look favorably in some way upon a country that's full of Jews, right? Just as, for example, children who are reared in happy Greek-American homes are going to find some affinity with Greece, right? At least a sense that, that Greece is my, part of my cultural heritage or something like that. So if you're thinking this, you're absolutely right. I don't think there's anything earth-shattering about what I'm saying. But I think it's still worth uh, underscoring for this reason. Some commentators who are concerned with how young American Jews uh, view Israel, who are concerned with this notion of distancing, they treat the phenomenon as if it were a matter of political party affiliation, of, let's say, of policy analysis, 
of sociopolitical ethics as, in a, as if in a kind of cerebral, uh, cerebral vacuum. Right? And not surprisingly, this is actually how the pundits themselves, the commentators, how they view Israel. Right? But this view, this approach is misleading as regards my own subjects. Why? Because the subjects regard Israel as a basic reference point and element of their individual and collective identities, irrespective of the moral and political virtues or failures of Israel. In other words, the subjects do not view Israel as a political ideological cause that needs constant justification, moral, political, what have you. They don't view Israel as an issue of public interest or a news item that they must follow every day, much less as a set of talking points for use in, in debates uh, either within these, the Jewish American fold or outside of it. Rather, for my subjects, Israel is an element of their basic self-respect and of their core solidarity with the kin group. So arguably, this is something that I'm, I'm still exploring in my work. I'm not ready to you know, you know, proclaim any big conclusions about it. But arguably, if that core solidarity becomes weak at the familial level, at the level of the local community, then I think you might have the possibility of serious estrangement from Israel, perhaps even a, a rupture. But my sense, at this point at least, is that the real or alleged behaviors and attitudes of Israelis don't by themselves make or break the Israel attachment. Just as I expect that the thoughts and actions of, let's say, Greeks or Irish or whatever don't cause Greek Americans and Irish Americans to regard Greece and, and, uh, uh, and Ireland as, quote, historic mistakes, much less as wholesale uh, affronts to human rights and to world peace and so forth. So it's to be expected that my subjects, all of them, not just the generic supporters, have been exposed to some English language news and the attendant polemics about Israel, but they don't mostly get caught up in the political play-by-play, -play, in all the moralistic back and forth that passes for public discourse uh, among the media mavens and intellectuals. And that actually reminds me of something that I see every day as I turn on my, my phone and I look at my Facebook feed. Uh, I happen to be friends with a lot of the, lot of the pundits, at least some of the pundits who, who argue publicly about American Jews. Uh, should they do this? Should they do that? How they sh should they relate to Obama? Should they like or not, not, not like Netanyahu? It's like a football game to them. This is not what I get from my, from my subjects. All right. So, so far I've been talking about a baseline, a baseline emotional predisposition toward Israel. But what happens when in addition to absorbing this predisposition, this positive approach within their families and local Jewish communities, young adolescents, excuse me, young American Jews have meaningful encounters with Israel and Israelis as adolescents and as young adults. In other words, at the time that they develop their sense of independence from the supportive framework of family and congregation. Okay. <clears throat> Recently, many uh, excellent scholars have written about uh, isolated phenomena that shed light on my question. Uh, phenomena like heritage tourism, Jewish summer camp, the, uh, the impact of day school Jewish educations, and so forth. Uh, some of the works I'm thinking of are indispensable. One of my favorites, by the way, is, is by, um, by Len Sachs and uh, um, and Barry Chazen, it's called 10 Days, uh, um, yeah, 10 Days of Birthright Israel, at any rate. Um, what's still needed, I think, is an integrated longitudinal portrait of how young Jews build their ethnic or national Jewish identity from early childhood through the summer camp years in college and then in the first stages of their lives after college, which is precisely when they enter the big world and can be influential as adults. What I found in this respect is that uh, through this long lifespan that I've just sketched, three recurrent factors <clears throat> facilitate the evolution of the people I've called generic or passive Israel supporters, their evolution into engaged Zionists, right? 
And by engaged Zionists, I mean people who place Israel and Zionist ideals at the front and center of their young adult lives by becoming, for example, pro-Israel activists, or even by immigrating to, to Israel, becoming olim chadashim, chayalim uh, bodedim, and so forth. What are these factors? Number one, immediate exposure to and friendly relations with Israelis who serve as models, who serve as mentors, or simply as important comrades. Factor number two, meaningful periods of residence in Israel, residence at various stages of life, through which the subjects become, or rather come to associate their nascent adulthood with their enjoyment of life within an ethnic polity, a polity in which Jewishness is normal, in which Jewishness saturates the visual and social environment, in which being Jewish feels natural and is not a social exception or a cultural alternative or a voluntary but expensive private sector club, so to speak. This is a Jewishness that doesn't depend on upholding traditional religious belief. It doesn't depend on strict observance of religious rituals or in some constant ethical or political justification that's directed at a peer group, being an, be it an existing peer group or a prospective peer group, right? Be it an internal peer group on a, or, or a group on the outside, okay? How are we doing so far? Am I being reasonably clear? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm tempted to use my old standby, which is, how's my hair? Yeah, it's not mine actually, this is from Gary Shandling. I, I shamelessly steal these things from people. Um, okay, so it's fortunate that, you know, that as this is being uh, uh, taped, I, I, I look this way because, you know, I can hide the bald spot in the whole thing. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so uh, <laughs> some of the people who have had classes with me here are going, oh God, not this one again. <laughs> so, anyway, the, uh, uh, the third factor, uh, actually, yeah, the third factor that I, that I think uh, facilitates the uh, transition from uh, generic support to active, you know, conscious Zionism is exposure to a brand of vehement, zero-sum, anti-Zionist identity politics in college. I'm specifically talking about a political stance that is held usually by radical students and professors, according to which Zionism is inherently a form of chauvinism, inherently a destructive ideology of Western colonialist oppression. Let's all shudder together. <sighs> so let me illustrate these two factors, uh, uh, these, uh, rather these three factors, and the effect that they've had on my subjects. Uh, I'll start with uh, item number two, which is uh, from the test, well, the, uh, the uh, information provided by a subject I will call Avi, and here he is telling me about his year-long volunteering experience in Israel. And I quote, the first four months which I spent in Jerusalem really didn't do very much for me at all. I had a good time, but I felt very much like a tourist. I didn't connect whatsoever, as in, wow, this is a Western wall. My thinking was more along the lines of, there's a bar nearby where I can, I can take shots for 20 shekels a pop. <laughs> Actually, on the flight over from the US, I did find an Israeli girlfriend. I dated that girl for six months afterward. That was a good relationship. But the second half of the year in the south of the country really influenced me. We visited an immigrant absorption center and I volunteered in a very underprivileged school and made friends with a lot of Israeli students. The Israelis who were working with me were preparing to join the army. Several of the girls who were volunteers were already in the national service. Anyway, I kind of ditched my American friends and found myself over, over time really connecting much more with the Israelis than with the Americans. I really liked the openness of the society. I really liked the sense of humor. I liked the fact that it was easy to make friends. I liked the communal aspect. It was a big contrast with the Americans in my group who were very spoiled, very mature, and unwilling to really get out of their social bubble. The climax for me was this. I was part of a team. We pursued different volunteering tracks. We'd have a week here for this, a week there for that. I chose to do a weekend trip with the Israeli scouts. The scouts were going on their sea to sea trip. 
You hike from the Mediterranean to the Sea of Galilee. I was 19 at the time. I went with a bunch of other volunteers. We basically helped out three 17-year-old counselors lead about 20 to 25 14-year-olds. For the 14-year-olds, this is like their march of allegiance. They're going to become official members of the scouting group, and this march is when they start becoming madrichim, guides, counselors, leaders. Those four days were memorable. I was totally blown away by how awesome the kids were, how awesome the counselors were, how much responsibility these 17-year-olds were given. I remember I really had a good time with them. When we finally got to the Sea of Galilee, all the 14-year-olds had to do to solidify their allegiance was make an oath that they were going to be good people and good friends and perform all their planned activities there. I thought to myself, not that I was planning to have, uh, or ha on having kids at that point, this is the kind of place where I want to raise my family, in Israel. I decided that some way, somehow, I'm going to make Aliyah, end quote. Making Aliyah, by the way, is, is a way of uh, saying I'm going to immigrate to, uh, to Israel. So uh, even though this fellow, Avi, uh, doesn't make clear what he means by awesome, he still makes it clear that he was deeply moved by his participation in a communal project. He was galvanized by witnessing and partaking of a self-conscious process of maturation that actually, I think, uh, resembled his own. Notice here that there's no, in his memory, there's no religion, right? There's no political dogma either. There's no wrestling with this or that aspect of Israeli policy or this or that Israeli attitude. There are no concerns with how an American administration should or shouldn't approach this or that aspect of relations with Israel. What we have here is a series of meaningful personal relationships that bond Avi to Israel and afford him a glimpse of a possible fulfilling future one that he might be able to realize as part of a Jewish collective that is not exactly available in the United States, save perhaps in, within an old-fashioned Zionist uh, youth group. Okay, so here's another example. My example is Todd. Uh, in item number three of the handout, he's describing his relationship to Israel, uh, or rather to Israeli fellow counselors at a summer camp, an American Jewish summer camp that he attended in the upper Midwest for much of his childhood and in which he eventually served as a, as a senior counselor himself. And I quote, I think there are two aspects that account for my receptivity to the Israelis. The first strictly had to do with me and my interests. At the time I became a senior counselor, I had just completed an overseas trip, the first time really that I had been abroad on my own. That was followed by my day-to-day -day interaction with the Israelis. We were together all the time. I wasn't really interacting with the Americans. I remember a couple, a couple of my American friends being upset because I was choosing to spend time, uh, more time with the Israelis than with my American friends from earlier years at the summer camp. I think part of my choice came from this very new realization that I can't relate to these Israelis so much, so I want to learn more and know more in order to connect with them. I was like, I don't want to say taboo, uh, because it's not taboo at the camp to choose Israelis over Americans. Rather. I was like a child who gets a new toy and wants to use and be with that toy all the time because it's new and exciting. I'd say that that, that was the number one aspect. Second, I'd also say that there's something in Israeli culture that I'm attracted to. I don't know if I can put one finger on it. I think it's things like the fact that Israeli men are very comfortable wearing whatever they want to wear. There's no, you don't have to dress up in suits to go out. It's not such a judgmental culture in terms of aesthetics and how you live your life day to day. I also love the Israeli, they don't think about being Jewish because that's where they're from, end quote. So you see the bottom line here, as I see it at least, is that Israelis are intriguing and attractive because they're people who wear their Jewishness unselfconsciously and unapologetically in ways that have nothing to do with being religiously observant or that may have nothing to do with being religiously observant. Israelis appear to these young American Jews, like Todd, as refreshingly free and genuine. They also seem, uh, uh, seem to the Americans as members of a warm, cohesive, if very argumentative society. Here's how Zach, a recent immigrant to Israel, put it. And this is item number four. 
After two months in Israel, I understood that the infamous Israeli lack of manners is because Israelis feel that they're part of the Jewish family. You don't have to be so superficially nice to your family. I like Israeli directness now. As a new Israeli, I'm happy to speak Hebrew with a lack of politeness because it's real. I feel much closer to Israelis that are strangers after a few sentences in conversation than I can feel close to Americans because even though we're not so cordial, we Israelis are actually communicating on a person-to-person -person basis. Tachlis, honesty is something that I really love." End quote. <clears throat> okay, but now notice how in addition to this visceral attraction to Israelis as interesting new models of being genuinely and intimately Jewish, there is also the experience of gaining a sense, at least an initial sense, of the sheer complexity of Israeli life, of Israeli society. Here's how a woman called, I'm calling Amanda, related to her own experience as a summer camp counselor among Israelis in the US at the time that there were clashes between the uh, IDF and Hamas in Gaza, in, in the border uh, with Gaza. Quote, <clears throat> Summer camp, Amanda says, summer camp was the first time that I had seen of my own account that there's all this turmoil, all these different choices that Israelis have to make every day, and all kinds of opinions that are swirling around among Israelis about their country and its political and social path. I didn't feel neutral about my counselor's debates, and by this she means the uh, Israeli counselor's debates. I just felt they didn't know enough to make a decision. I really just asked them, what's Operation Protective Edge? I spoke to a lot of my Israeli friends among the senior counselors. I asked them what they were doing, how they felt. One Israeli friend said, quote, AIPAC just released a statement about protective edge. I'm so upset. I can't stand AIPAC. They're totally wrong, end quote. It was interesting to see that the Israelis always had news on their phones. All the websites they would read, Haaretz on the left or Israel Hayom on the right, just the vast diversity of what they were thinking. At one point, the camp administrators felt that there was so much contention among the Israelis that the administrators wanted to inform the camp's national staff members because the kids were asking about it. All American counselors were encouraged to say to the children, why don't you ask this Israeli counselor? An Israeli camp camper would ask any counselor about the situation, and that would open the floodgates to all the other campers to ask, what's going on in Israel? Or, hey, did this happen? We, the young American counselors, directed campers to Israelis who not only were really informed, but who wanted to talk about the conflict and who really knew how to talk about difficult things with an eight-year-old. To me, what was a revelation was seeing that there were so many Israelis, people who already believed that Israel should be a state just by virtue of having, having been born there and living their whole lives there, saying, I can't believe the government is doing this, or I can't believe this is a response from this American public group. I kind of thought, wow, I can be in favor of Israel's existence and still be skeptical of the way that Israel's proceeding. Zionism became broader for me. I realized Zionism is a lot more than approving of the existence of Israel. Besides there being a spectrum of Zionism, I don't think I fall in the middle between anti-Zionism anti and Zionism. I think I fall very much in, what would it be, the right, the left? I am a Zionist, but there are Zionists on every side. After summer camp, I wanted to explore more. I wanted to do Jewish in college. I wanted to have a Jewish relationship. My university is the first I have been to since Hebrew school where I can have a Jewish identity that's supported by other people in Hillel, etc. I dove in right away." End quote. Okay, so as some critics would have it, the conniving American Jewish establishment whitewashes Israeli sins and rigidly enforces a kind of Israel right or wrong ethos among young Jews. That, ac that accusation is perhaps accurate, I think, at some level, right? But what strikes me about respondents like this Amanda is that the more they have participated in recreational and educational programs designed for them and run precisely by major mainstream Jewish organizations in the US, the more these people have gotten to dip their feet into aspects of Israel's rich political culture and the greater their appetite for engagement in Jewish life and with Israel in particular. Okay. Now on to factor number three, anti-Zionism. 
Here are two examples of what I mean. <clears throat> Item number six is an excerpt from my interview with a young professional that I will call Stu. He told me that in college he was not only a very indifferent Jew, but that he was a political radical, dead set, dead set against any form of nationalism. All his radical progressive friends were categorically anti-Zionist. But eventually he changed course when he felt their hostility, and I quote. I realize that for these leftist students, their behavior and their liberal humanist values were not lining up. From my unhappy childhood as a member of a reformed congregation, I had always been very sensitive because it made me so bitter to situations when people are contradicting themselves, when they're not actually practicing what they preach. So I ended up getting in a lot of fights with, uh, with a lot of my anarcho-socialist friends. There was this one Indian girl of Muslim origin. Ever since I had met her during my sophomore year, she would re only refer to me as Jew. She never said my name. She just said, hey, Jew. I remember one time we were at a party, and she called me, hey, Jew. And I responded, hey, Muslim. People were like, oh, Stu, you can't do that. I said, what do you mean? She just called me a Jew. I didn't even say my name. She's a fucking racist. By the way, pardon the uh, profanity. These are his words. <laughs> uh, I, I continue. People just didn't get it. My friends argued that, quote, you can't be racist against Jews. There's no such thing as anti-Semitism anymore. It died with the Holocaust. <laughs> By the way, this is exactly what I was taught in the Reformed Jewish community. There's no anti-Semitism anymore. It died with the Holocaust and blah, blah, blah. Check your white privilege. You need to feel bad for everyone else. So after the party in which the Indian student had called me Jew, I was thinking, first of all, I'm not white. I have a dark complexion. I look Mizrahi. Second of all, fuck you, this is racist. This sort of realization really peppered my experience during my last years in college, and it made me sensitive to what Palestinian solidarity activism among these students was all about, a denial of who we Jews are. When you bring to young Palestinians the documents from the Waqf from before, the, from before 1967 that say the Haram al-Sharif is indisputably the site of Solomon's temple, they don't know that Palestinian nationalists changed the party line after 1967 when Israel took over the Temple Mount, so these young activists say, this is not the Israelite temple, and the alleged temple never existed. It's so political, but the young Arabs and the young Americans who are indoctrinated into this anti-Zionist line have no idea of what the history is. In college, I started to learn about Zionism in a class on the subject. I started to learn Hebrew. I also started to challenge my non-Jewish and Jewish friends on the political far left. What I found is that they were identifying who I am for me. So all these anti-Israel kids would say, Judaism isn't an ethnic group, you're a religion. Then I would say, how can I be a religion when I'm an atheist? And when the membership in this group has nothing to do with what you believe. There's no communion, there's no shahada, there's no test of faith you have to take. You're born into this ethnic group whether you like it or not. And even if you go and practice another religion, if you decide to become a Buddhist, you are still a Jew according to traditional Jewish law. So you who say Jews are a religion are obviously idiots. Then they started introducing all these crackpot Khazar theories claiming that Ashkenazic Jews have no connection to the Middle East and all this other stuff that was so racist. Okay, I end quote. The next item, number seven, is part of my interview with a woman I will call Liz. She describes in this part her rude introduction to the protest culture of anti-Zionism in college. I quote, I really felt comfortable and safe being Jewish until I came to college. And all of a sudden, you see people who hate you just because you're a Jew, and they don't even know who you are. They just hate you because they associate you with Israel. And you realize, holy hell, it doesn't matter what I think. This is just a group of people that are going to be continuously spreading anti-Israel, anti-Jewish propaganda. I tried to differentiate when I went and talked to different anti-Israel activists on campus between Israelis and Jews. And they didn't. They used Jewish and Israeli interchangeably. And they were just blatantly anti-Jewish, blatantly anti-Jewish. For example, there was an old lady at some anti-Israel stand in the university's public outdoor mall. I said to her, so can you tell me this? Do you have a problem with the Jews or with Israelis? She responded, I'm just going to tell you this one thing. I don't understand what she meant by it, but she said, giving self-determination to Jews is like giving self-determination to Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney. 
And I said to her, so you don't agree that Jews should be in the land of Israel? She said, absolutely not. It's not their land. They should get out. And I said, you know, I agree with your logic so much that I'm leaving the United States because I don't feel comfortable li living on the land that belongs to the Native Americans, which we stole from them. And I'm returning to my homeland. She said, where is that? I said, the land of Israel. She was livid, but listen, and I really believed it. I said, you cannot hold double standards. I felt like I was fighting for myself. When I started college, I didn't necessarily want the relationship with Israel, but I felt like it was thrust upon me. And the people who thrust it upon me were the anti-Israel people. Pro-Israel people, I would just walk by them and I wouldn't turn around. Oh, okay, fine. But when people start attacking me because I'm Jewish and associating me with Israel, even if it's not by choice, it's being forced upon me. And so I concluded something like, well, if you're forcing it upon me and I'm being held responsible for Israel, then I need to do whatever I can so that I have a clear conscience, knowing that whatever I'm being held responsible for, I'm doing whatever I can to make sure that it's according to how I believe one needs to act. Because all of a sudden, this responsibility for Israel was forced upon me. So I felt, okay, well, what do I do now? My Zionism today is actually a way of confronting the people who hate Israel so much and who want us to leave it. They are the reasons that I moved there. They don't realize that they created this. They created the monster that they're fighting. And that to me is so funny. It's almost comical when you think about it. Okay, end quote. I think what Liz's reaction tells us uh, is that when a young person's immature, mostly passive attachment to Israel, if you will, is founded in Jewish self-respect, as it is, by the way, in all the cases that I've surveyed, it, this attachment may be stirred by external stimuli so that it develops into a politically, politically conscious stance. This stance, or, or developing the stance, can catapult the subject into a deep investigation uh, and a personal investment in Jewish culture and in Zionism in particular uh, as anchors of, of a new adult identity. So, uh, all the excerpts that I've given you so far capture aspects of the answer to the second main question that I posed earlier and that I now uh, have to address, namely what does Zionism really mean to my, to my interviewees? Well, for one thing, I think it means connecting to, quote, something that is larger than myself, right? This is a phrase that I heard from several of the subjects. To them, adopting the noun Zionist as a, as a, as a self description is to link their fates, their personal fates, to something transcendent. And again, I think that something transcendent is what they perceive to be the historical super family, the Jewish people. And this is, again, irrespective of whether the Jewish nation state conforms to some ideal image of American style liberalism or European style liberalism, not to mention uh, any, any model of postmodern and postcolonial virtue. Second, I think being a Zionist to my subjects is to adopt a model of Jewishness that breaks the mold of religiosity that still largely underwrites American Jewish culture. I have to explain this a bit. Uh, for better or worse, I think American Jews have long fit into the broader American society as a protected religious group, not so much as an ethnic group. That's why, for example, uh, the U.S. Census allows Jewish subjects to report their Jewish religion, but never to ca categorize their ethnicity as Jewish. Right? They have to actually write it in. Uh, it's no, no secret, I don't think to anyone, he, anyone here, that a very extensive congregational and denominational system makes American Jews, uh, in many ways, who they are and differentiates them from other diasporic Jews and from Israeli Jews. Religion in this context is usually defined rather narrowly as theology, ethics, and God worship. So this narrow definition shapes the public identity of American Jews. But again, for better or worse, this is something that can leave many proud Jews who have a strong sense of ethnic solidarity, especially those Jews who uh, have secular outlooks, it can leave these Jews in the lurch grasping for some form of non-traditional social experience, 
for conceptual language that expresses their sense of kinship with other Jews, their sense of shared history, their sense of collective memory, their sense of a connection to a geographic homeland and to a culture that goes with it, a culture that goes beyond chicken soup, beyond lox and bagels, beyond Seinfeld and Jackie Mason. <laughs> Zionism is one solution to this particular problem. And here how, how Todd puts it, and I'll try to wrap up in a moment. I think there's an element of, OK, I'm born into this Jewish identity whether I'll have it or not. So where can I find other people like me that are kind of secular and still identify with being a Jew? Israel is largely that place. I would say that as a college student, I was, I don't want to say different from my, uh, than my Jewish peers, but I had an awakening when I went to Israel for my year of study abroad. I went there during the Second Lebanon War and immediately felt that I fit in. There's a feeling I get in Israel. It's not that the secular relationship I have with Israel really doesn't make any sense, but when I'm in Israel, I feel like this is the land. This is what we're defending. I don't care about the particulars of religion, but I care about thinking this is our land. There's a connection in Israel that I'm not getting in America. To give you an example, my home state is important in early American history and in the history of the American Constitution. I don't care. I love being an American. I feel blessed to be an American, but there's a spiritual high I feel in Israel that is incomparable. I think it might be a form of spirituality, not necessarily a traditional religious feeling. Another aspect to consider uh, here is that attachment to Israel, and here, this is me talking, not Todd. Uh, another aspect to consider is that attachment to Israel offers young American Jews a way to express criticisms of American Jewish society as they have experienced it. It also allows them to achieve in the process either a secular or a, what you might call a neo-traditionalist rapprochement, the coming together with their ancestral nationality. This is usually expressed as an embrace of a sense of adult responsibility for the collective Jewish present and the collective Jewish future. Let me close then with the words of another subject I, I will call Seth, who argues precisely along the lines that I've just sketched. And I quote, American Jewry is a liberal group. My parents vote Democrat, and socially, they're very liberal on lots of issues that occupy American Jewry, abortion, civil rights, and so forth. But at a certain point, you can care, care about everyone until caring about everyone stops you from being you. That's what's happening to what was happening to American Jewry when I was growing up. We cared so much about taking care of everyone and being part of general society that we lost our unique identity. And to me, unique identity is more important now than caring about the world. What I saw happening was, was that when the phrase tikkun olam became the new Judaism, it destroyed and is currently destroying American Jews because they really believe that taking care, care of kids in Africa and saving the whales and cleaning up the environment is the sum total of Judaism. What happens when parents raise their kids this way is this. Your parents send you to college and your non-Jewish neighbor in the dorms also wants to save the whales and take care of young black kids in Africa, so you start dating her because you have the same values, and you say to your mother, hey mom, my girlfriend also believes in tikkun olam. How wonderful that she's been raised the way I was raised. When you liberalize something beyond and you disconnect it from its roots, namely unique Jewish identity, and actually from Jewish thought and history, that's when you compromise it. That's where I hold tight to the ideal of a strong Jewish identity and consider that identity more important than being part of liberal society. I think that this is when I connected to Zionism as a national collective movement that is an ideal of society, of working together to get going somewhere, building together the idea of achdut, of Jewish unity. This movement meant more to me than just me and my family. It meant all of Jewish history. And then I felt this overwhelming, wow, I'm a part of something so rare, so unique, being a Jew. I never had this as a kid. I'm not sure a kid can appreciate it. I think you need to be a little bit older to grasp it emotionally. That it is rare to be a Jew in human history. It is rare to be a Jew living in the land of Israel in human history. It's rare to be a Jew celebrating Shabbat in Israel. And that as a Jew, you are part of something so great. Forget the fact that all of our great, great, great grandparents fully believed in Torah. They decided to suffer, to be slaves, to be murdered, raped, punished, impoverished, and kicked around, to go through all that suffering without giving up on their culture, just to have another generation that also cares about Jewish identity. How incredibly selfish would it be to say, it ends with me? Okay, 
So that concludes our regularly scheduled program. I am now happy.